fellas, it's Raptor Jesus here with a video on my hints and tricks on uh, building a settle your very first settlement for your first D&D campaign. So usually I like to start my settlements fairly small. This will be your starting settlement, which is the one that's going to be nearest to your very first dungeon. So this is going to be the spot that most your players are going to be using for uh, how to get their starting equipment, uh, meeting their very the important non-PCs of the town like the wizard, the cleric, the outfitter, uh, the mercenary captain. And so the way I set up my map is I actually start with uh, the buildings first before I start drawing out my map and I'm going to use this example of Helix from the Barrow Maze Mega Dungeon by Greg Gillespie which I think is really cool. And can't go wrong with choosing a Mega Dungeon uh, either like any of the Greg Gillespie ones or Castle Zintillion is a really good one. Anyway, so I like to set up uh, each of the areas that you're going to be buying goods from with the non-PCs that are in that building and also a list of goods. I usually go around six. And these goods uh, should change like every season. And this will uh, uh, kind of create like a living world with, through the settlement itself without having to go and develop this great living world beyond the settlement. <clears throat> Some important buildings I think uh, for your settlement should be uh, a church of some sort, a place for the players to sleep and an outfitter, uh, which is kind of like a general store. It's an old time way of saying general store. I just like using that word outfitter. Um, a lot of these like D&D settlements are also very more resemble Old West settlements instead of actual medieval fantasy settlements, but that's okay. I think it's a decent period to draw inspiration from, if you ask me. So... So what you'll do is set up the church. Your should be probably the first building you're going to set up, because this is where you're going to get your healing. And also the the quote-unquote inn might be more of a hostel that is run by the church since I think your churches and your temples in your world should offer a lot of like uh, services for the poor to help the people essentially so this is where why they charge so much exorbitant prices for healing and resurrections because a lot of this is being trickled back into the communities as a form of donation and to help the poor and, and those various things at least if it's a good temple. <laughs> Your next spot is basically the bar, the tavern, the place. Uh, this is the meeting hall for the town, smallest towns itself. And sometimes I even like to set uh, the government up as this is where they hang out and talk about politics is in the local taverns. I think that's a little bit interesting, especially for smaller communities. I think it makes a lot of sense. Another often uh, misrepresented area is your adventurer's guild. And me, myself, I like to have it as a mercenary's guild. As the person that runs this mercenary's guild, the captain is actually a, a low-ranked noble. As the no nobility, being part of the nobility is the only way to get a lot of mercenary troops, which will become important later during domain play because you want to sort of link the players into the ranks of the nobility uh, and this gives them more credence and such uh, to do ver the various political machinations and having lots of mercenary troops and the funding and such in order to build settlements themselves. So I usually have the mercenary captain as an actual rank, the lowest rank in nobility, and uh, you can limit uh, people that aren't part of the nobility to around having 20 mercenaries, so this is a sort of a way to entice them to 
seek those further ranks, or to grab them themselves and just kill all the nobles if that's what they're into. But I won't fault you for the way you you guys play. <laughs> And I think the next important person is like the court wizard, uh, because this is where your beginning mages are gonna like learn their spells. And uh, something interesting you can do with them is to have them be a collector of historical artifacts. So your various like strange urns and pieces of artwork from lost civilizations and rare books uh, can be sold to this character in town. And this kind of entices the players to collect those kinds of treasures and such. Uh, maybe they only offer spells to people that give them rare goods. Instead of just every person that walks into their oddities and rarity shops. So your cleric is also an important character. Because uh, he can provide healing and guidance in various aspects. And provide a little bit of quests which... I think ultimately that's what most of our PCs are there for, am I right? You can also have like your everyman available, like for uh, Helix, uh, I chose that to be the Miller. He's kind of your everyman. He offers some, you know, in my world, guns, because I like to have guns in my world. I think just think they're cool and there's lots of available firearms in the medieval times. And also his wife provides a uh, special uh, spider silk clothing. So I think that's a little bit something interesting to give the town, like uh, expensive goods that more powerful characters can eventually obtain later that might not really make sense, but perhaps it's because of a material that they have to go gather for the town uh, in this instance going and killing giant spiders in order to get the spider silk so you can get really cool rope or a really nice cloak that's maybe resistant to spider poison in some way small way that's up to you I suppose alright I guess that's the rest of the video fellas if you have any questions, please comment down below. I hope you liked my video. If you want to see more of this stuff, please uh, subscribe. I hope you guys uh, have a good game next time you play, and keep your shield arm strong, alright?